Hello everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, <laughs> wherever you happen to be. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I've seen in your comments that there's a little bit of confusion with the time change in the US. Um, yeah, these time changes really like to keep us on our toes, right? Um, next week, I think, in Europe, we're having ours. All right, so um, let me introduce myself. My name is Mairead and I am in Galway in Ireland. Um, it's actually quite nice today, surprisingly. Um, yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, so of course it poured rain all day long, as is tradition. <laughs> um, I can see from the chat box that you're from all over the place. We have India, we have the US. Um, it's just wonderful to see you all here from France, London. Oh, hey, Carmel from County Waterford. Good to have a fellow Islander uh, with us here today. Um, so let's get going because we have tons to practice or tons to talk about and practice today. Um, our topic is teaching writing. Okay. Um, unfortunately, writing tends to be quite neglected in the EFL classroom um, for I'm not actually sure why, perhaps because it's time consuming. Yeah, but it tends to be quite neglected. Um, so hopefully today you're going to learn lots of tips um, to introduce it to your students, okay, and to practice it effectively. Um, so let's get going. Um, a lot of people think that if you can write, or excuse me, a lot of people think that if you can speak a language, um, that automatically means that you can write it too. Um, you know, some people think that writing is just a written version of speaking, um, but actually that is not at all true, okay? Um, writing is very much a skill um, in its own right. Um, let's look at some ways that written language differ from spoken language. Um, first of all, writing is not as spontaneous as speaking, okay? That's one of the good things about writing. You know, we have time um, to think about what we're going to put on paper. Whereas when we're speaking, we just have to produce something and hope for the best. Um, writing can be planned, it can be drafted, it can be changed, it can be edited. Okay. Um, so in that sense, some students will find it a bit easier. Um, but that said, others will find it more difficult because they'll be agonizing for ages over word choice <laughs> in a way that they wouldn't really be able to do when speaking. Um, with writing also, it can be kind of daunting for students because there is nowhere to hide with writing, okay? Um, spelling, punctuation, grammar, word choice, organization, it's all there on paper, it's on permanent show. Um, whereas with speaking, you know, sometimes we can kind of um, cover up the fact that we don't know a word or we can move swiftly on, okay? So, you know, writing is different to speaking. Some students will love that, some students not so much, okay? But it's good that we understand the differences. Um, the good news is that with writing in any language, um, we tend to follow a process, okay? And students will already know that process from their own language, okay? So the way they write in their own language can be applied to how they write in English. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the writing process that we will hopefully um, instill in our students. Um, try to encourage your students to follow the same process um, that they would in their native language. Okay, writing in English isn't this completely different scary process. Okay, it's the same as the process they would follow in their own language. Um, typically, um, when we have to write something, we would study or examine model texts, right? Um, for example, if I had to write a report, um, I wouldn't be super confident that I know what a report should look like. So I would go off, I would research reports. Yeah, I would see what they look like. And that would help me a lot um, towards writing my own report. Um, typically, the writing process involves steps like brainstorming, selecting ideas, planning, drafting, rewriting, proofreading. Yeah, so these are all the things we would do when writing in our native language. So why not encourage our students to do all of that in English? 
um, when it comes to writing and the writing process, preparation is key, okay? Don't throw your students in at the deep end and say, okay, now sit down and write an essay, okay? That's gonna freak them out. It's not going to help. Um, so try to follow the process. Um, in real life, um, typically when we, when we are handed a written text, um, we typically react to it, right? Um, you know, we would think, hmm, that was interesting, or, oh, I'm not sure I understood that, or, oh, I totally disagree with that. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what our reaction is, but we would typically react to something, um, or to a written text. Um, we can replicate this really easily in the classroom by using peer interaction, okay? So, you know, when students have finished writing, they can swap their work with their partner and they can comment on it for each other, okay? Um, if we can encourage students to do these things, like studying model texts, um, planning, proofreading, reacting, yeah, in time, hopefully, <laughs> um, this process will help them improve their writing skills. Um, it has to be said, when it comes to writing, um, it's not something that can be fixed really quickly, okay? Teaching writing is like playing the long game, okay? Um, it's not typical to see amazing improvements very quickly, okay? It's something we need to work on, we need to chip away at. So, now that we've spoken a little bit about the process, let's put that together. Um, let's look at the stages then that we would typically have in a writing lesson. Okay, and some of these are going to be familiar from stuff you've already seen, I'm sure. Um, so when we're teaching a writing lesson, um, the first thing we want to do is to have an appropriate warmer to establish context, okay? Just like every other type of lesson, the warmer is key. Um, so, for example, if the task coming down the line is perhaps um, writing a review about a book, yeah, writing a book review, the logical warmer would be to have students talk about books, okay? You could ask them maybe, um, tell each other about the last book you read, tell each other about the first book you remember reading, we could ask them to talk about their favorite book. Um, we could ask them to talk about a book they started but never finished. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter. It could be anything as long as it's related to the topic of the task, in this case, books. Yeah, so we're warming up their brains a little. We're getting them thinking about the topic. Um, that's really, really important because remember I said, don't throw them in at the deep end, okay? We've got to lead them, lead them gradually to the task. Um, so warmer is key, okay? Um, then once their brains are warmed up to the topic, um, we then want to provide a model text, okay? So we could bring them in, for example, um, a book review, a well-written book review. Okay, why do we do this? You're probably asking. Well, it's important we give them a model text or an example text um, to analyze for register and structure. Okay, um, a lot of students will tend to write in a very, very formal style because perhaps that's what they've been taught, they've been taught at school, perhaps. But I tend to find that students go formal <laughs> rather than informal. Um, so a model text will give them an idea how to pitch their language, okay? Um, something like a book review, depending if it's um, on a website, yeah, or in a magazine, I'd say it would tend towards neutral register. Um, perhaps neutral, bordering on informal, colloquial. Okay, but it's important that we provide a model text so that they can gauge the register. Um, it's also really important for them to be able to see the structure. Okay, like, does it have a title? 
is it divided into paragraphs? Yeah, how many paragraphs? Are the paragraphs of equal length? Okay, how do they start the book review? How does the book review end? Yeah, um, it's super important that we do this. Yeah, because I know if somebody told me, going back to my previous example, if someone told me to write a report, oh, the thing I'd stress out about most is what it should look like. <laughs> um, and I'm sure students would feel the same. So by providing a model text, um, we're, we're giving them reassurance. Yeah, we're giving them confidence. Um, now, that's not to say that you need to spend ages and ages analyzing the model text. Yeah, but you could at least spend five to 10 minutes um, talking about it with them. Okay, identifying the features and the structure and the register, as we said. Okay, so once we've gone through our model text, um, the next stage we can do is to pre-teach. Okay, um, and here we just want to give our students some useful language. Um, so we want to pre-teach important vocabulary or grammatical structures um, that are relevant and that we think they will need. Um, for example, going back to our book review, we might decide to teach them some adjectives, yeah, some strong adjectives like um, mesmerizing, okay, or exhilarating or um, appalling, okay. Um, that's not to say that they will definitely use these strong adjectives in their book review. Yeah, there are no guarantees, but at least we're giving them some useful language, you know, that they can use if they need it. Um, as well, in the process of pre-teaching, no doubt students are like racking their brains. They're pulling out all of the adjectives that they can think of, um, even if this is happening on a subconscious level. So um, again, even if they don't use what we pre-teach them, it's still incredibly useful. Um, when you're pre-teaching, remember, try not to pre-teach too much, okay? Because if we go overloading them with 15 adjectives, okay, what's gonna happen? Well, the class is going to turn into a vocabulary lesson, yeah? And they're going to lose sight of the actual writing. Um, so when it comes to pre-teaching for a writing lesson, I would probably try to cap it around five items. Yeah, um, just make sure they're really useful ones. Um, so what have we done? We've warmed up their, their brains to the topic. We've looked at a model text. We've given them some useful language. Um, the next stage is going to be what we call the pre-writing stage, okay? So this is where we put our students into pairs or small groups and we let them brainstorm and plan what they're going to write. OK, so the pre-writing stage is really, really important. Yeah, this is where they take notes of loads of ideas. Yeah, it's where they start to put like the, the skeleton of what will become um, their, in this case, book review. Um, down on paper, yeah. Um, from teaching lots of students, um, lots of writing, I can tell you that the one biggest complaint that they have is I can't think of any ideas. Yeah, I can't think of what to say. So the pre-writing stage is where we preempt this problem, okay? We let them talk to each other and come up with as many ideas as they can. Um, while this is happening, yeah, while students are brainstorming ideas in pairs, um, you as the teacher can walk around and if you notice that any group is struggling, you know, you can go over and you can prompt them. Yeah, you can ask them some guiding questions um, to prompt them to come up with ideas. Yeah, um, so by the end of the pre-writing stage, yeah, every student should have at least three or four ideas down on paper. All right. Um, if you notice that the pre-writing stage is not going well and it's like tumbleweed rolling through the classroom and nobody has any ideas, um, then don't panic. Just turn it into a whole group. 
brainstorming phase. So you go up to the board, you write the topic in the middle, for example, books, yeah, and just turn it into a good old fashioned mind map or a spider gram. Okay, and then the students can just gradually start calling out words. Yeah, you can add them to the map, to the mind map, um, and then use those words to develop some ideas. All right, um, basically, do not let them leave the pre writing stage without ideas. All right. Um, so the pre writing stage would probably go around 10 minutes. Yeah, but you can give a little longer if you need it. All right. So let's recap. Students have thought of an I, they've thought of the context, they've seen a text, you've given them useful language, you've made sure that they have some ideas. Yeah, the next thing is just to sit down and write. <laughs> Um, now, depending on time constraints, you might have students write in the classroom there and then, or you might give the actual writing for homework. Okay, it depends on how much time you have. Um, but wherever students do the task, whether it's in the classroom or at home, um, you need to give them a meaningful task. We'll look at this in a moment, what I mean by meaningful task, but you've got to give them a meaningful task and really important, you've got to give them a word count. Yeah. Um, I know when I was a student, there's nothing I hated more than not having a word count because I never knew what exactly was expected. Um, would it be enough to do two paragraphs? Should I write an entire page? Oof, it's, yeah, it's awful not having a word count. So make sure you give students a word count and make sure you give them enough time to write. Yeah. Um, depending on the level of the class. Yeah, for example, you might give them a 250 word word count and 40 minutes to write. Okay. Or if it's a, a lower level class, you might give them a word count of 100 words and give them 25 minutes to write. Okay. You know, that'll depend on the level of your class and how long the text you want them to write is. Okay, so if they've written in the classroom, great. If they've done it for homework, fine. Um, but the next thing we want to do when all of the texts are ready is to allow for peer interaction. Um, remember we said that we typically react to a written text? Yeah, so this is where this happens. Um, so you might say, now I want you to swap your book review with your partner. Yeah, and think about this question. Based on the review, would you like to read this book? Why or why not? Okay, so the students would take five minutes to read each other's work and then in pairs, they will give their reaction. Yeah, they will tell each other, would you like to read this or not and why? Okay, um, that's a really important step, I think, because you know, it makes students feel like they've written for a reason, okay? Like their their text has an audience, yeah? Um, they've achieved uh, they've achieved the task. So you know, always try to allow for some sort of peer interaction. Now, if you're really brave, yeah, and if your students are quite a high level, you could even incorporate some peer correction there. Um, so you could ask them, for example, um, read the book review, read your partner's book review, decide if you would like to read the book or not. And if you happen to see any minor errors, yeah, you can tell your partner about them and see if your partner can correct them. OK, now I have to say. I would only do that type of peer correction if I knew my class really well. Um, if I knew their personalities really well, and if I knew that they wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah, and if they felt like they could be honest with each other. Um, so I wouldn't always do peer correction, but, you know, if it suits the group, it can be a really, really nice activity to do. Um, so then when you've done that, you've got to collect the work for marking. OK, so run around, collect up all the papers and uh, keep them safe, okay? 
I can't tell you the number of times I flew into a panic as a new teacher. Um, you know, I would collect uh, all the students work and then I would panic because I couldn't find it because I tucked it in a book somewhere or I'd left it under other books on my desk. So, you know, learn from my mistakes, <laughs> have a special folder, um, put the writing straight in there so that you always know where it is. OK. Um, how quickly you correct their writing, you know, depends on your workload. Sometimes you'll be able to give it back to them in the next class, sometimes the next week. Yeah, um, it doesn't really matter how long it takes you, as long as it doesn't take you ages and ages. Um, but it doesn't really matter if it takes a week, for example. Just, you know, try to have it back when you tell your students you'll have it back. All right. Um, and while we're talking about it, um, let's look at some more pointers for correction. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with correction codes. Yeah, so correction codes are really useful, especially for like higher level classes, like say B1 upwards. Um, a correction code is basically a, a system of letters um, that you use to indicate mistakes. Um, for example, if you have a spelling mistake, yeah, you might underline the spelling mistake and write above it SP. OK, SP for spelling. If you notice that a student has used a wrong tense, OK, you might underline the wrong tense and write WT for wrong tense. OK, um, make sure it's a code that your students know about. <laughs> yeah, you have to explain the code to them in advance, obviously. Um, but it can be a really, really nice way of correcting because you're not giving them the correction, you're just telling them what type of mistake it is. And then it's up to them to go back and try to correct it. OK. Um, so you can have like tons of codes for spelling, wrong tense, article, preposition. Yeah. We have a question mark for I have no idea what you're trying to say here. Yeah. So by marking up their work with a code, it puts the responsibility back on them um, to correct their own mistakes. Um, so what I would typically do is take their work home, mark it up with the correction code, and then for the first maybe 15 minutes of the class where I'm handing them back their work, um, you know, I give them back their work and I give them that 15 minutes um, to, to um, check out all of their mistakes and try to correct them. All right, then it's just a matter of, you know, keep monitoring, keep walking around, and uh, make sure that everyone is correcting um, with the correct answer. Um, of course, if there's something they have no idea how to correct, tell them, yeah, and move on. Um, so yeah, correction codes are amazing. Um, if you Google them, you'll find loads of them. Um, I'm sure you'll find one that will suit you and your students. Um, I would also say, um, when you're correcting writing, try to avoid red pen. Oof. I'm sure you all have horrible flashbacks to your school days and just seeing, you know, a piece of writing that you worked so hard on just obliterated in a sea of red. <laughs> um, that's never a good feeling, right? So, you know, try to find a more friendly color. Um, I was a big fan of purple. <laughs> or um, if the students had written in black, I might correct in blue. Yeah. You know, as long as it's a contrasting color, I think that's that's good enough. But try to steer clear of red. Um, when you're marking students' work, remember to acknowledge the good as well as the bad. OK, we don't want to fall into the trap of just saying wrong, 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 correct, correct, correct. OK, we also want to give credit where credit is due. OK, um, I always use two pens when I'm correcting. I have one color for my corrections and another color for, hey, good job, well done, I love this word, or I love this sentence, yeah, or a, a big tick next to a, a well-expressed idea. Um, another way of doing corrections, like if you're running a bit short on time and you don't have time to, to correct everything, um, anonymous whole group feedback sessions work well. Um, so look at all of the work, yeah, look over all of the work, 
pick out some errors that you see crop up time and time again. And um, in class, just write the incorrect sentences on the board or the incorrect words on the board. Uh, obviously, don't say who made the mistake because, you know, we don't want to call people out. That's really embarrassing. Um, but write up all the, the common errors on the board and say to the students, I'm going to give you 10 minutes to see if you can fix these errors. OK. Um, so that can be a really nice way too of uh, a time a time efficient way <laughs> of correcting lots of mistakes or lots of common mistakes. Okay, so there are just uh, there are just some things to bear in mind when it comes to correction. Okay, um, now remember a few moments ago um, I talked about giving students a meaningful task. Well. Let's dig deeper into that because that's really, really vital. Um, when it comes to writing and writing tasks, students must write for a purpose, okay? They need to know the purpose of their text. Are they writing to inform, to persuade, to entertain, etc.? cetera? Um, the task must have enough context. It must have enough detail for them to ascertain um, the purpose of their writing. Um, as well as that, students need to know their audience, um, even if it's a fictitious audience. Yeah, they need to have some idea in their head of who would read their text. Um, this is really, really important to establish the tone and the register of their writing. Yeah, again, do they need to write in a formal in a formal register or an informal register, or will they try to hit a neutral register somewhere in the middle? Okay. Is their tone going to be bright and breezy? Yeah. Is it going to be more serious? Okay. Um, you know, the task needs to contain this information so that they can do it correctly. Um, here is an example of a horrible writing task. And it's a writing task that I remember doing myself at school. Um, write 10 sentences about your house. Oh, that was it. That was the task, write 10 sentences about your house. Okay, this is a horrible task. Why? Well, let us count the ways. <laughs> um, the task has no purpose, okay? Why am I writing 10 sentences about my house? Like, why? No context, okay? It has no obvious audience, okay? Like, who would want to read my 10 sentences about my house, okay? It is not motivating or inspiring in the slightest, okay? Um, it's a really, really poor task. And we want to avoid tasks like this as much as we can. Um, now, let's look at an example of an effective writing task. Um, so imagine this, you decide to advertise your house on Airbnb. Write the ad, trying to persuade strangers to rent it. Mm, stranger seems like a strange word there, doesn't it? But you know what I mean. Trying to persuade strangers to rent it. Describe the location, decor, rooms, facilities, etc. Read the example ad on the handout for inspiration and write 100 words. So you can see that the basic bones of this task is exactly the same as the previous one. Yeah, you're writing about your house but it is a much better task, a much more effective task. Why? Yeah, why is it more effective? Well, let's see. It's engaging, okay? Um, it has communicative purpose, okay? They're writing for a reason, yeah? They're writing to persuade and to inform. It has context, yeah? Airbnb ad. Everybody knows Airbnb. Um, it has real life application, yeah? Um, as well as that, it has a genre, yeah? It's an ad, it's an advert. Uh, it has an audience, okay? All of the other people who use Airbnb to rent houses, yeah? Or flats. Um, it offers a model text for guidance. Yeah, so you can show a lot of uh, similar ads just to give them an idea of the type of thing you want and finally it has a word count yeah 
So let's look back at the task and see. Even though it looks short, it has all of those things. Okay, genre, context, audience, yeah, a model text, a word count, and it has real life application. You know, it's a it's a fun task. Students typically enjoy this one. Um, so there we go. Bad task, good task. <laughs> so this is what I mean when I say um, students need a meaningful task. Okay, so when you're writing your tasks or when you're devising your writing tasks, um, you know, you could almost use this as a little checklist just to make sure that you're hitting all of the factors necessary to make the task effective. Um, now, my example of a good task was an ad, yeah, an ad for Airbnb. Um, but there are tons of types of tasks that can be very easily contextualized like this. Um, and, you know, not all writing needs to be really long, okay? Because, you know, a lot of the writing we do in real life is, is quite short. Um, for example, a message in a card. Yeah, this can be a fun writing task when we don't have tons of time or when we want students to do the writing in, task, in class rather than for homework. Um, so we could say something like, um, so it's your colleague's birthday and there is a card being passed around the office. Um, write your birthday wishes and also include a funny anecdote that you and your colleague um, shared recently. OK, <clears throat> and, you know, students can write their message. Yeah, they have their context, they have their audience, um, they have their genre. Yeah, they have their register. OK, so it could be message in a greeting card. You could have them write a presentation, a postcard, a note. Yeah, perfectly valid, short and sweet. Um, an ad, an essay, um, a book or movie review. Um, you could have them write a story or a play. Um, you could have them do text messages. And text messages are amazing for super colloquial, informal language or abbreviations. Um, with the lower level classes, application forms can work really well. Um, emails, letters, etc. Okay, if you're really pressed for time, even things like social media updates, like write a tweet, yeah, write your Facebook update, yeah, you know, writing doesn't always need to be long and complicated, okay? Get creative. As long as your task is effective and it includes all of the factors we saw previously, you're on to a winner. All right, so whew, that was a lot of information. Um, I'm going to get my breath back. And in the meantime, I would like you to pop any questions you have about what we've said over the last 30 minutes or any other questions you may have about writing into the chat box. Okay, we have nearly half an hour to answer any questions you may have on the topic of teaching writing. All right, so fire away, get busy typing those questions into the chat box. In the meantime, I'm going to look back over your messages so far and uh, check out where you all are. Oh, from India, from Armenia, oh my goodness. From South Africa, hey Mervyn, I remember you from before. Hope you're keeping well. Okay, we have Italy. And Lesotho. Oh, Mexico. Hi, Wendy. I hope the weather is better in Mexico than it is here today. It's after turning very grey after our 30 minutes of sunshine. Okay. So I don't see any questions yet. I know it can take, take time to process um, all of that information. Uh, so, hi, Greca. Nice to see you again. Long time no see. Um, I haven't done a webinar in oof, nearly two months now. 
Um, so, hi, Mairead, nice to see you again. Lovely to see you, Greca. How often do you suggest planning for a writing lesson? Mm, good question, Greca. Um, I think it depends on your class and how much they need writing practice. Um, if you are teaching, for example, an exam preparation class, um, they will need to write, you know, as part of their exam, perhaps a Cambridge exam or a Trinity exam or IELTS. Yeah. In that case, you would be doing at least one writing class a week. Yeah. Because writing is such a huge part of um, the exam they're preparing for. Um, however, if you're just teaching um, a general English class and they don't really have any um, need to write for um, examinations, yeah, I might do one every two weeks, yeah, or well, I might do one like purely writing class, yeah, one every two weeks, or I might just do a couple of shorter tasks, yeah, all throughout the week, okay. Um, so normally, like when I'm doing a lesson that's just writing development, yeah, I will do it once a week for exam classes and once every two weeks for general English class. Yeah. And in the meantime, I will do like shorter tasks here and there just to change things up. Um, so yeah, Greca, it, it depends on what your students need um, to be able to do. All right, thank you, Greca. So, hello, Carmo. Um, do TEFL students do formal written exams? If so, how long is the exam? Um, yeah, Carmel, there are tons of different exams that students can do. Um, these exams are what we call proficiency exams. Um, and it's when students need to um, demonstrate or certify their level of English. Um, so the three big ones, yeah, would be Cambridge exams, yeah, um, Trinity exams, and IELTS, okay. Um, if you haven't heard of those before, not to worry. Um, when you start teaching, I'm sure you will definitely hear of them. Um, and, you know, these exams are intense, you know, they are hours and hours and hours long. And, you know, they're pretty high stakes for students. You know, students have to spend a lot of money to sit the exams. Um, they need to dedicate a lot of time towards studying for the exams. Um, so, yeah, they're a big deal. Um, in a lot of schools, um, in a lot of language schools, um, students will be, you know, divided into streams. They could go to the general English stream or they could go to the exam preparation stream. And, you know, the exam preparation students are just doing, yeah, exam preparation, <laughs> okay? It's just a lot of, a lot of writing, a lot of reading, a lot of listening, all following the exam structure. Um, so yeah, there are certainly formal exams. Um, absolutely, you'll find out all about them um, when you start teaching. All right, good question, Carmel, thank you. So, hi T, how are you? I remember your name from before. Welcome back. Um, are there any authentic materials for teaching writing? Um, well, not specifically, but I think any authentic material can be used um, to prompt writing. Yeah. Um, for example, um, you could bring in a ton of holiday brochures, for example. And you could give your students a task like um, you're emailing your friend in another country um, because you're trying to plan a holiday. Yeah. Um, these are some of the holiday options. Yeah. In the holiday brochure, um, write the email to your friend outlining your three favorite options. Yeah. And why you think they're good options. OK. So, you know, that would be one way of using authentic materials to prompt writing. Um, you know, you can bring in cards, you can bring in postcards, you can bring in application forms. Um, I know whenever I see a stack of application forms anywhere, I grab them. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sure the people are always looking at me like, what on earth is she doing? Why is she taking like 20 application forms? 
Um, but you know, application forms are amazing. Um, great authentic material and wonderful for lower level classes who need to practice, you know, spelling their name, giving their address, um, personal details, etc. Okay. Um, so yeah, anything, any type of authentic material can work to, um, you know, we're not limited at all. Um, all right, thank you. Good question. All right, so Mervyn, let's look at your question. What have you found from your experience, students' general sentiment on a writing lesson? Well, I guess Mervyn, it kind of depends. Um, you know, much like anything, there are some students who really like it and some students who really don't. Okay, um, for that reason, it's really important that we follow the process. Yeah, that we don't just throw students in at the deep end. Um, because if a student, for example, lacks imagination, yeah, and they find coming up with ideas hard, we can cover this um, while, um, you know, while leading them through the process, we can give them ideas, we can give them a chance to, to produce loads of concepts and words. Um, if they can't think of the ideas themselves, we can feed them ideas, yeah? So, you know, while there will always be students who aren't so keen on writing, if we follow the process we talked about, you know, we can make it a lot less painful for them, okay? Um, when it comes to writing, boof, it's all in the preparation, okay? Warm up the brains, let them see model texts, give them useful language, give them ideas, yeah? And then, you know, we've done everything we can. Um, but yeah, Mervyn, absolutely, it varies. Some love it, some hate it, <laughs> more, more or less like everything. All right, thank you. All right, so, hey, Mr. Mad, cool name. Um, how does this subject vary between age groups? Um, well, I guess, you know, if you're teaching kids, well, if you're teaching very young kids who can't write yet, you know, you wouldn't be doing writing. But, you know, as soon as kids are able to write, yeah, you can get them writing about topics they know, topics they like. Yeah, even if it's only a couple of sentences. Yeah, you could say like, oh, today we're going to make a poster for the classroom and everybody is going to, uh, to, to put something on the poster so that all of the other students can see it. Yeah, and then they can just write their couple of sentences about whatever or even words, yeah, they can write words about whatever your topic is. Um, and then the older the kids get, the more, you know, the more um, elaborate tasks we'll be able to give them, okay? So, you know, just keep it suitable, keep it age appropriate, and yeah, keep the, keep the length of text you want them to produce realistic. All right, thank you, Mr. Mads. Okay. Hi, Emma. Um, how would you integrate teaching spelling of new vocabulary which may show up in the formal exams? Hmm. Well, Emma, I guess we would just kind of deal with this as it arises, you know. Um, if I was teaching, a, teaching an exam prep class, um, well, I am actually teaching an exam prep class, so I can tell you exactly what I would do. Um, when, when, they, um, when they hand up their writing for correction, um, I look at the words that they misspell quite frequently, okay? And I kind of make a list, yeah? So that at the end of every week, I generally have a list of 10, 20 words um, that I've noticed misspelled, okay? Um, then if I have time, I'll turn it into a game of some sort, yeah? Like I'll give the class the correct spelling and just turn it into like some sort of, of a spelling test, yeah? Um, like, um, you know, whichever team can get seven words in a row correctly, um, you know, win the chance to decide the topic of our next class, yeah? Or get to decide the, the, the subject of um, our next speaking task, yeah? Um, if I don't have time to turn it into some sort of competition or game, I will just give them um, the sheet with 10, 20 words misspelled and just send them home to look them up in the dictionary and correct them, okay? So, you know, 
I think when you have exam classes, they're super motivated anyway, you know, so I don't feel the need to like check up on them. I, I trust that they will uh, work out the correct spelling for themselves and memorize it. Um, I'll also tell my students like, look, this is a really good online dictionary. You know, I don't mind you using it during class. You know, if you need to whip out your phone and check the spelling of a word, that's fine. Okay. Um, you know, as I said, normally exam prep classes, they're super motivated. So, you know, I trust them to get on with it, basically. Um, of course, if there is um, if there's a new word I'm teaching, just as part of vocabulary, um, you know, improving the vocabulary, when I'm teaching the word, I will emphasize the spelling a lot. You know, that's part of the, remember, we always talk about MFP, meaning form phonology. Um, that's part of the F of the form. Okay, so as you teach a new word, always emphasize the spelling. All right, thanks, Emma. Good question. Um, so, hi, Natalia. Uh, for pre writing, you mentioned five vocab items different to the reading comprehension of the usual 12. Could you please clarify? Yeah, absolutely, Natalia. Um, normally, in reading comprehension, sure, we could do 10, 12. Um, items um, because that's really really important for comprehension okay like we're removing the the obstacles from the written text okay but when we're teaching them to write okay um, we don't want to overload them okay because they'll already be thinking about okay I need to write an introduction I need to write paragraphs yeah, I need to keep things neutral. I need to keep the tone positive and upbeat. Okay, they've already got so much going on. Um, five items or so is enough to add into the mix in terms of useful language. Okay. Um, you know, when you're teaching reading or listening, by all means, you know, you can pre-teach a lot more because then all they're doing is, well, all they're doing, you know, it's not easy either, but, you know, they just need to concentrate and understand. So you can add in more items. OK, but yeah, for productive writing, yeah, keep it limited. Um, also, Natalia, you've seen that there are like lots of stages in a writing lesson. So we simply don't have time to go teaching them loads and loads of, of useful language. OK, we don't want to derail um, the lesson by turning it into a, a big old vocabulary fest. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if that makes sense, Natalia. I hope it does. All right. Um, so Mr. Mad, depends on what structure they're learning under. Um, yeah, you know, it depends on their age, their level, all that sort of thing. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, okay, Emma and Say, you are more than welcome. And Mervyn, I'm glad those ideas helped. And Natalia, really glad that made sense. <laughs> um, good, good. Uh, let's have a look. Reza, how often should writing be taught? Um, well, Reza, we answered this question um, earlier. OK, um, and it basically went along the lines of it depends on how much your students really need to write. OK, um, you can look back in the webinar when this goes online in a couple of days. Um, we talked about that um, at length earlier on. Um, OK, thank you, Reza. Um, OK, Mr. Madge, you are more than welcome. I hope that helped. Um, Okay, so we're out of questions for the moment. So let me just go back, uh, just in case I've missed anything. Sometimes I, I tend to look through them quickly and miss things. Um, okay. Okay, Fran, I'm glad that has helped you. Um, yeah, you know, when you when you start looking at all of the, you know, the stages of lessons uh, for different types of, of focus, you know, you, you will notice that these have a lot in common. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap. Um, for example, every type of lesson will have a warmer. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, every type of lesson will include some sort of preparatory phase. Um, they have tons in common. Okay. All right. Um, so I don't see any questions. Um, well, while you're all thinking of more questions for our final 10 minutes, um, why don't I tell you a little bit about um, word counts and time limits? Um, because I know when I started teaching, that is one of the things I struggled with a lot. Um, now, remember I spoke a little bit about um, formal exams, proficiency exams. I tend to take my word counts and time limits from um, the Cambridge exams. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if you're dealing with a B1 class with an intermediate class, yeah, you might be looking at about 100 words max per writing. OK, and, you know, you should be giving them about 25, 30 minutes for that. OK, so, you know, 100 words would be a good guideline for intermediate students. Um, if you move up to B2 or upper intermediate students, um, you'd be looking at about, you know, between 180, 200 words. OK. And, you know, you should be giving them about 35 minutes ish, 35, 40 minutes for that. OK. Um, if you're dealing with advanced students, like very high level students, um, you'd be looking at about, you know, between 240 to 280 words. OK. And, you know, you'd be giving them about 45 minutes for that, 40, 45 minutes. OK. So, you know, a lot of times, especially for assignment C in the level five course, um, a lot of students make um, writing one of their tasks for assignment C. And that's absolutely fine. You know, that's a good task. But they give crazy word counts like 500 to 700 words. OK, um, this would never happen. OK, for the really even for the really, really, really advanced class, you know, 280 would probably be as long as you would ever give them. Yeah, 280 words. So um, if you're ever wondering about word count, check out the Cambridge exams and see what their typical word counts would be um, for all of the different levels. That's a really good guide. All right. Um, so Carmel, are gap fills and comprehension questions good writing practice? Um, well, Carmel, we have to think about um, why students are writing. Um, if students are doing a gap fill or if they're doing comprehension questions, chances are that, you know, they're not um, they're not writing to develop their skill of writing. Yeah, they're just writing to prove that they've understood something. Um, so when we talk about teaching writing, we mean like um, developing the skill of writing, you know, not just writing answers to questions. Yeah, but putting together um, a nice extended piece of writing. OK, does that make sense? Um, so when students are doing things like gap fills and comprehension questions, they're not really developing the process of writing. Yeah, they're just proving understanding. Um, so, you know, that's absolutely fine if that's what you need them to do. Like if you need them to, um, you know, complete the gaps with the correct tense. Yeah, that's great. You know, that's a great controlled practice activity. Um, but it's not really classed as developing writing as a skill. OK, um, what we've been talking about today is developing writing as a skill. Yeah, using correct register, using correct format, expressing ideas etc. Okay. Ah, good, Carmel. I'm glad that makes sense. Because <laughs> um, yeah, it can be quite, you know, it's quite hard to like separate your brain into writing for comprehension and writing to develop the writing skill, the writing process. All right. Um, 
So advice T, how about right true or how about true or false questions or multiple choice questions? Are they good or do they need to be avoided? Well, yeah, basically, as I just said to Carmel, you know, these things are absolutely fine if you're checking comprehension of a text or of a listening or of a grammatical point. But if your aim is to um, develop students' writing skill and writing process, um, they would not be the most effective type of task. Okay. So um, I hope my previous answer to Carmel cleared that up for you. All right. Um, so hello, you, you, have you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun to read. <laughs> uh, do you often get students working in pairs or groups on writing tasks or usually solo work and anything to say about how these work in practice? Um, yeah, sure. So as I said, um, when we're doing the stages in the writing lesson, um, you know, we have our warmer, we have our pre-writing stage um, where students are brainstorming, coming up with ideas. Um, in these stages, absolutely let them let them work in pairs and groups. Yeah, you know the old saying, two heads are better than one, right? So where it's possible, let them work in pairs. Yeah, but when it comes to the actual task of writing, like now sit down and write your Airbnb ad. Yeah, it's best to let them do that alone. Okay, because if you put them in pairs, it can be really frustrating for the students because some can write more quickly than others. Yes, yeah? some race ahead, others need more time. There's like a general, there's generally a miss, uh, a mismatch of, of tempo. <laughs> um, so like let them do all the preparation in pairs for sure. Yeah, but the actual writing, let them do it alone. Um, then remember, we talked about some sort of peer interaction where they swap work and comment. You know, you can put them back in pairs for that. OK, now that's not to say that um, there mightn't be a task that they could do together. You know, who knows if you can get super creative and uh, and make a task, a task in which they can write together. But it wouldn't be the norm. OK, so hope that makes sense. Oh, good. That does make sense. You fab. <laughs> um, all right. Um, let's take a look. Natalia, generally, what are the typical activities for each level to practice and extend writing skills? Oh, Natalia, it totally depends. Um, remember the list we saw before? Um, so, you know, you could do any of these. The really good thing about writing is that you can give them any genre, really, and, you know, just simplify the task to suit their levels. Yeah. Like even, you know, an elementary student could write a message in a card. Yeah. Or an advanced student could write a message in a card. It's just the task that determines um, the difficulty of what they need to write. Um, so, you know, don't limit yourself to, uh, to thinking that some types of writing are suitable for lower levels and some for higher. OK, you know, while it's true, true that we wouldn't have elementary students writing an essay, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, we could adapt most other genres um, to suit their level. So, you know, you can make it um, you can make it easier by giving a lower or a higher word count. Yeah. By giving a simple, straightforward task or making that task more difficult. OK. Um, everything can be modified to suit the level. All right, good. Okay. Let's see, Mervyn. Let's have a look. Please list some sites for the correction codes you mentioned. Oh, Mervyn, I don't have any on hand. Um, let me do a super quick Google. Let's see if I can find the one I use. I don't remember the site off the top of my head. Um, oh yeah, okay. I see the exact one I use. Um, let's see if I can get the table for you. Okay, this is the one I use, but if you Google it, 
you can find ones that are you know more basic and more complex depending on the level that you're teaching okay so let's have a look okay i'm going to pop it in the comment box so you just need to look at the the code at the top all right um so that is the one that i use um with my exam prep students especially um, but I've also added in some of my own stuff, okay? And that's the, the beauty of a correction code, okay? You can make it exactly what you need it to be. Just make sure that your students understand it too. All right, stick it up on the wall, give them all a photocopy to stick on the inside of their notebook. Yeah, make sure they understand the code. All right, excellent. So everybody, our time is up. I do not believe it, but flew by. Um, so hopefully I got to all of the questions. I'm pretty sure I did. Um, so I guess there's only one thing left to do, and that is to say goodbye. And thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, hopefully you feel a lot more confident now about uh, making your students do some writing. All right. Don't shy away from it. It's it's it can be really fun. OK, just everything hinges on the task and the preparation. All right. So before you go, it would be great if you could um, scan this QR code. It will bring you to a survey and you can tell us um, what you thought of the webinar and if there are any suggestions you have for improvement for future webinars. Um, I'm also going to put the link in the chat box in case you don't have your QR scanner handy. All right, there you go. Okay, so everyone have a wonderful rest of weekend and hopefully we get to see each other again soon. All right, bye, take care.